All right, let's get started. This is uh, coming toward the end, the home stretch here for team, just uh, by way of announcements. We will have a session again on, the 20, on, the, on uh, March 8th, session 23. I'll be doing that one. Brian is, will be out of town watching Kane and play, hopefully in the, in the NAIA tournament. And then March 15th, uh, Brian's back. And then March 22nd is closing ceremonies, the last team of this season. So just coming toward the end, make sure you're, you won't want to miss the closing ceremonies especially. So uh, if someone asked me at the door if, I'm gonna, if I have a good joke today. Good is a relative term when it comes to these jokes. They often come from some of you or from Brian. He did not send me one today. I did not ask for one today. So we're going to take a departure from the typical team uh, way we do jokes. And uh, this, this could go really well or, or pretty poorly. But um, I like puns. My daughter and my son, who's just are in college, we like to text each other funny puns we come across. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to share with you some good puns, get you some groaning going on, and then we'll move on. Uh, at the bank today, an old lady asked me to check her balance, so I pushed her over. I told my wife that her eyebrows had been drawn too high. She seemed surprised by that. It's way better, isn't it? The past, present, and future walked into a bar. Things got a little tense. Come on, that's a good one. I know you have to think it's early. I saw an ad for burial plots and thought to myself, that's the last thing I need. <laughs> Atheists cannot solve exponential equations because they don't believe in higher powers. <clears throat> we need a drum kit. You know the first computer dates back to Adam and Eve? It was an apple with very limited memory. Just one bite, everything crashed. <laughs> I know, it's awesome. You know, my uncle died when nobody could remember his blood type. He kept telling us to be positive, but it's hard without him. I thought that was good. All right. You should never trust atoms. They make up everything. Some of you are like, I don't get it. Ask the guy who looks smart at your table. <laughs> I've been reading it. Yeah, it's right or awake. I've been reading a new book about anti-gravity. It is impossible to put down. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there because we just can't take any more. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be here all week. Seriously, my son and daughter and I like to send each other puns we come across, and we think it's hilarious, and I'm glad that you humored me. Okay, so the, the clip today comes from a great, great movie. One of the great sports movies of all time, I think. Um, it's uh, the movie Remember the Titans. And this scene in Remember the Titans is the scene where Gary, one of the captains, wants one of his friends, who's a white player, Ray, off of the team. If you don't know the story, it's, in, it's this in story of integration uh, at, a, at a school uh, in, in Virginia that is um, bringing black and white school together to integrate them and the, the, how the struggles of the team. Gary wants Ray off the team because Ray has been uh, missing blocks on purpose to make the black players on the team look, look bad. And this is the confrontation scene uh, that, that happens between Gary and Ray. Coach, can I speak with you in private? Sure. What's on your mind, sir? I want Ray off the team, Coach. You know my policy, Gary. Yes, I do. And I respect it, but I know that Ray missed that block on purpose. Sometimes you just gotta cut a man loose. Hmm. Well, you're the captain. You make a decision, but you support your decision. Ray? You're out. What? I'm not gonna let you play for this team anymore. Oh yeah, Jerry Lewis? Gonna go and tell Coach Coon what to do just like last time? But then that's right. He is your daddy now, isn't he? Coon don't cut anybody. Remember, Gary? I had you cut, Ray. You willing to just throw away our friendship for them? You can keep them. It, 
it is admittedly a pretty intense scene. If you haven't seen the movie, I think it's worth seeing, uh, both for just the story in general, but also that it deals pretty intensely with issues of race. And I, the friendship there, so Ray and Gary are teammates from a previous season and good friends, and there's this confrontation where Ray says sometimes you just got to cut a man loose. And it's, it's a, if you think about it, it's a pretty powerful thing. I remember a good friend of mine, Julian Spencer, he's pastor of Main Baptist Church in Aurora. So he's preached here a couple, uh, last year, I believe. Uh, some of you may know uh, Julian. Uh, he, he said to me, um, one time we were having, I think we were over breakfast, at his favorite restaurant, the Cracker Barrel. He said, uh, my black friends and, my, and black pastors that I interact with don't like when I say this. He says, but the truth is, if we take, we we're talking about race issues in the church, and he said, if we take the gospel seriously, then you are more my brother as a, as a Christ follower than my African-American friends who are not believers. And it should be the same for you. He says, he says I get in trouble in black communities for saying that, but that should be the truth that you're more my brother, meaning those things that we share in Christ trump the things which would otherwise divide us in our culture. Last week, we took a different look at, we, at mentoring in Paul's life, uh, his relationship with Timothy, and today we um, dig into a, a letter that's, I think, not often read or preached on or talked about, but it's maybe the most explosive and profound little letter in all the New Testament. It's the letter from Paul to a man named Philemon. It's just one chapter, 25 verses, so we're going to read this portion, this whole letter, and then unpack it as it relates to these relationships for us. Okay, Philemon, verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now an also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent." So that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention what you, that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark... Uh, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now, reading Philemon like we just did, if you haven't read it before or studied it, it's kind of like jumping into a movie in the middle of, uh, right in the middle of it, and you don't know all the characters or the setting, and you have to kind of catch up quickly on what's going on. So let me try to catch you up a little bit on the storyline here. Paul wrote this letter, the shortest letter in the New Testament, from prison. He writes it to a man who he calls his brother and fellow worker in the Lord, Philemon. Uh, Philemon was a wealthy Roman citizen. He lived in the city of Colossae. We know that from Colossians 1, 7 and other, uh, other places in the, in the book of Acts where Paul references him. He likely met Paul during his ministry in Ephesus. The reason I say that is the reference to Timothy there who was working in Ephesus. And so I won't get into the details here, but most biblical New Testament scholars believe that Paul met Philemon in the city of Ephesus, modern day Turkey, and in meeting him is led to Christ by Paul, comes to faith in Jesus Christ through Paul's ministry. And then he becomes a, so he becomes a follower of Jesus, 
and he meets this man named Epaphras, who's mentioned here in the letter. And he and Epaphras start a church in Colossae, which is Philemon's hometown. In fact, Paul even says, the church that meets in your home, referring to Colossians. So Paul's uh, talking to Philemon, who he led to Christ, who now with Epaphras has started a house church in his home city in Colossae. Got the story so far? Like all Roman patriarchs and homeowners, Philemon owned slaves. This was, now when you think, you hear slavery, I hear slavery, we automatically think of new world race-based chattel slavery of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries in America. That's not what the Bible means when it talks about slavery. It's talking about much more like indentured servitude, people that are working off a, a debt, maybe a, a generational family debt. They could often, often buy their freedom, save enough money to get out. It wasn't necessarily a good thing, but it wasn't the horrific thing we think of, like when you think of the movie Roots or what went on in our own country in, in the 17th and 18th centuries. Anyway. That's this guy, Onesimus, who's one of his slaves. Now, Onesimus, at some point, has wronged Philemon. We don't know what he did. We don't know if he stole, if he, what happened, but he'd done something that, that wronged his master, his owner, and so he flees. He runs away. And eventually, for reasons that aren't disclosed, Onesimus meets up with Paul, which is either divine providence uh, or Onesimus went looking for Paul, because what are the odds that this runaway slave in the, in the ancient Roman world would find the one guy who was good friends with his former master. And in, he meets with Paul, I think perhaps, and I, I've read about this, and I think perhaps this may be, I'm speculating here, but perhaps it's because he's looking for help. Maybe he remembers the ministry of Paul to his master, remembers the words of Paul, and he goes looking for him to help him settle this relationship and maybe earn his freedom somehow. Anyway, he, Paul ends up leading him to Christ. He calls him my younger son, my son in the Lord. So Paul now has led the slave owner and the slave to Jesus. And Paul says that Onesimus has become very dear and very helpful to him. He wants to keep him. He's become a, an encouragement to him and a personal aid of sorts. But he finds himself in a tricky situation, right? Here I have this young man, this, guy, this slave, Onesimus, who has run away from his owner and I know his owner, and they're both believers in Christ. So what's he going to do? First thing I want you to see is that a spiritual friend prays. You find yourself in a difficult situation re regarding relationships, any relationship, particularly spiritual friendships. Do you pray? Paul begins his letter with prayer. I always thank God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, you might think, well, he's, he's softening him up for what he's going to ask him to do. I don't think so. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. That word partnership, you see it there in verse uh, 5, or actually verse 6, that is the Greek word koinonia. That means, it literally means sharing or commonness, having things in common. Paul's saying, if you have any common bond with me, if we share anything in Christ, partnership is the way it's translated. But we, you hear partnership and perhaps you think business partnership or it's not, it's saying there's a, something we share that transcends the things which would divide us. And he's saying if that's true about us in Christ, then he's going to ask something of him. As followers of Jesus, what we share transcends all the things which would divide us. Some of you might remember a guy named Mike Smith. Mike used to attend church here, been part of our church for a number of years, now moved away to Nashville a number of years ago. Mike was part of team for many years. And I remember getting to know Mike years ago and I talking to Mike, and Mike was a blue-collar guy. He did put in floors and was a, really a very really intelligent guy, but never went to college and was, worked with his hands. It was an excellent craftsman. But anyway... He, he sort of had this funny way of talking about white-collar guys, like he didn't, he didn't like them too much. And he said, here I am at team, and his first team table was a bunch of guys who were accountants, businessmen, MBAs, and, and executives. And he goes, I wouldn't even like these guys if it wasn't for Jesus. Now I love them. Meaning, if it wasn't for Christ, I would never hang out with them. I wouldn't talk to them. I certainly wouldn't sit at a table with them every Friday morning at 6 a.m. and share my heart with them. But now I do because of Jesus. It transcends the things which would divide us otherwise. The basis of Paul's argument is that he's going to absorb the cost of Onesimus' freedom. This is, this is a profound thing he's saying. Verse 17 and 19, did you catch it there? He says, if he owes you anything, charge it to me. Isn't that an incredible line? 
I'll pay. Paul's acting out the role of Jesus in the gospel. You and I, because of our sin, are separated from God. And in, in a sense, Jesus says, charge it to me. I will pay what you owe. I'll cover the cost of purchasing their freedom. Now, Paul appeals to Philemon for why he should consider this request, is that they share something in common. Second thing you see here is a spiritual friend builds up. I thought about this. Paul, Paul could have ignored the whole thing. He could have said, well, slavery is not really a good thing. And even though Onesimus didn't earn his freedom the, the proper way, the legal way, you know, and he ran away, still, you know, we can just, now that he's a Christian, I can just write this guy a letter and say, you know, let's just let it bygones be bygones. Or I could ignore the whole thing. I mean, wh wh why do you think, what motivates Paul to write to Onesimus and set, or write to Philemon and send Onesimus back to him? Think about what he's doing. He's sending a, ro a, a runaway slave back to his master with a letter. This is unheard of. First of all, that a Roman citizen, Paul, would intercede to another Roman citizen, Philemon, on behalf of a runaway slave was just unheard of in that culture. Nobody would do that. Think of the courage it takes for Onesimus to go back with just a letter in hand. Are you sure this was enough? You know, no money, no, like, no, no. Why would Paul do that? Paul understands something about the gospel that many of us miss. He understands that if we're serious about what we share in Jesus, if we're serious about this brotherhood in Christ thing, then this can't stand. This unreconciled relationship between Philemon and Onesimus, can't, we, can't, we cannot ignore it. Remember years ago, a man came to make an appointment to see me in our church who was frustrated uh, by um, money owed to him by somebody else in our church. He had given a, a business loan of sorts to somebody who it didn't go well, apparently, and that person had not paid them back and was ignoring their calls. And they're both in our church. And he's like, listen, can you help broker a sit-down? He's like, I don't want to sue. I don't want to take this person to court. I don't want to do that. that doesn't, that's not right. Uh, but I can't just let it go. And I reached out to that person. And the individual who owed the money was resistant and unwilling and basically finally just said, stop bothering me, pastor, and this individual. And it eventually came to the point for this individual, they had to say, well, okay, I trust you, God, with that because I don't know what other recourse to take here. But the point is, that was a deep rift that caused pain in the church family between two brothers in Christ. It shouldn't be. Paul recognizes that if we're serious about Jesus and about calling ourselves brothers in Christ, then th we can't just ignore this. You got to go back. You got to do it right. It's a profound thing. He builds up Philemon, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. And he builds up Onesimus in the letter. He says, I appeal to you on base of my son, Onesimus. He doesn't call him your former slave. He calls him his son, who while I was in, became my son while I was in chains. I mean, I led him to Christ when he was in prison. Formerly, he was useless to you as a, as a thief or a runaway. But now he's become useful both to you and to me in Christ. The, the, the book of Paul, Paul's letter, to, the second letter to Corinthian church in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about the ministry of reconciliation. He says, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation because we've been reconciled to God. Now, most people read that and they think, yeah, that means like sharing your faith with people who aren't believers, encouraging them to be reconciled to God. It certainly does mean that. But I think first and foremost, it means how we treat each other, how we love and forgive and serve each other. What does Jesus say? The world will know you are my disciples if you protest often, right? The world will know you are my disciples if you have lots of Facebook posts about the things that are wrong with the world. That's how the world will know. The world will know you are my disciples if you are really smart and know the Bible back to front. What does he say? The world, by this, the world will know that you belong to me, my disciples, if you love one another. The fundamental witness that Christians have to the world is not how smart they are, how good their arguments are, how much they protest, how moral they are. It's how we treat each other. Because... But according to Roman law, Philemon had every right to punish Onesimus severely. Depending on what, his, what he did, he could have killed it. He could have had him executed. He has every right to not do what Paul's asking. In fact, Paul's saying, 
not, don't just not punish him. That's mercy. You know what mercy is? Not getting what you deserve. According to Roman law, Onesimus deserves severe punishment. So Paul's saying, give him mercy by not giving him what he deserves. Paul goes beyond that and says, I want you to welcome him as what? As you would me. As a brother, as a family member. That's grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. You understand the difference? Mercy is, I'm going to withhold punishment, which I would legally and rightfully, in the terms of the culture, be justified in meeting out to you. But grace is saying, not only am I not going to strike you, I'm going to bless you. Paul is subverting uh, an important culture. Like, this is the socioeconomic fabric of the Greco Roman world depended on this kind of servanthood and slavery. Paul's asking Philemon to do something that would be shocking. Not punish him, forgive him, welcome him back, not as a servant, but as my brother. This is crazy talk. What would possibly compel Philemon to do that? Last, a spiritual friend calls out the best. A spiritual friend calls out the best. Verse 17 through 21. So if you consider me a partner, there's that word again, koinonia, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. He's referring to his own Philemon came to Christ through Paul. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Paul earlier says he could have played the, the authority card, right? He said, I could tell you because I'm, I have authority spiritually over you to do this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to appeal to you on the basis of love. It's the more powerful motivation, isn't it? How have you played sports when you were younger? Much younger, some of you? Okay. What's the stronger motivation for performance on the athletic field or court or whatever, or mat? Is it fear of failure, anger toward your opponent, or love of your teammates and the opportunity to compete? There's a hierarchy of motivations, right? Fear will, fear will help to a point. But eventually, you sort of freeze up. But if you're afraid of getting yanked by the coach, if you, if you mess up, that, that motivates you to a point, but it can't ultimately free you to play your best. Hating your opponent, that was my big one when I was younger. I would work up imaginary scenarios in my mind about this guy across me in football. He, 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 he went after my sister. You know, just whatever stuff. And kind of work myself into a frenzy, right? That motivates you to a point, but that only, it, it, it's temporary. It doesn't last very long. But the greatest motivator is a deep love for the opportunity to compete and for your teammates and for this, this, this game that you enjoy playing. Paul says, I'm appealing to you, Philemon, on the basis of the ultimate motivator. Not authority, not power, not fear, not you have to or you ought to, but on the basis of love. Which love is he talking about? It's easy to read that and think, oh, he means like Paul's love for Philemon. Yes, but there's more. He's talking about Christ's love for both of them. I'm appealing to you on the basis of the love of God, the ultimate motivator. Not, and I think so many men that I interact with, we go through a Christian life like motivated by the wrong stuff. Fear, guilt, obligation, duty, they'll take you so far. But the ultimate motivator to do something as radical as what Paul's asking is not fear. It's not obligation, it's not duty, it's love. It's knowing the depth of God's love for you. That's, the whole un that's what undergirds this whole story is. If you really get what Jesus has done, you'll understand why I'm asking this of you. Have you ever done something that seemed crazy for the sake of the love of Christ? Or been asked to maybe and shrank back from it? Paul is calling Philemon to do the right thing, to welcome Onesimus, as a, not as a slave, but as a son and brother in the Lord. The whole letter is an, a, 
And this is the only one of Paul's letters, by the way, where he does not specifically reference the cross and the empty tomb, the resurrection. He implies it because the letter itself sort of acts it out. And if you think deeply enough, you can find yourself in any of those three positions in the story, can't you? You may not want to admit this. I don't know where you are on your own journey, but every one of us, if we see ourselves accurately from the Bible's perspective, are Onesimus when it comes to the cross. We're all runaway slaves who deserve punishment. We've wronged our master, and we run from him. And our only hope of freedom, true freedom, is that somebody else will, will purchase our freedom for us, right? Somebody else will pay what it costs to set us free, and that's Jesus. If you're honest with yourself, you probably have been or maybe are and can see yourself in the position of Philemon. I want to do the X, and I know that I can be justified in the world's eyes by doing X, but I think deep inside the gospel compels me to do Y. I don't want to do that. This is better for my, my bottom line. This is, makes more sense in the world. This will improve my business. This serves my needs. I don't, I, besides, I, I hate that guy. But the gospel moves us, compels us, nudges us, and sometimes we need a Paul to say, look, I know what the law is. I know what this person did. But I'm asking you to look not at the offense, but to the cross. I appeal to you on the basis of love. And some of you probably have been in the position of Paul at times, where you're standing, you're looking at two friends, and you're going, this is not right. This should not be. And you're in the role of trying to encourage them and appeal to them on the basis of who Jesus is. I think if we, the point I'm trying to make is this. If you see yourself as Onesimus spiritually, then it motivates you to play the role of Paul or Philemon in the story when the time is right. To get that. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever seen something that was off in a friend and thought... I'm not saying anything because it will ne they'll never listen. It'll go, I know where this will go. It's not going to go anywhere. This will just, they're just going to get angry and, and defensive, and I don't have the time for it, and I don't need their nonsense. Anybody? Yeah, right. Yeah. If your hand's not up, you're not listening, right? Or you're, <laughs> or you're lying, right? Every one of us have done that, have felt that. The, the, the truth is, we, Paul does not know. He says, I'm confident of this, that you'll do the right thing in the Lord. But he doesn't know for sure what Philemon will do. It's, it, there's a risk involved, sending Onesimus back. He's not responsible for the results, but he is responsible not to ignore the offense. I, I, I want men in my life who are like Paul. I don't mean spiritual giants and wrote three quarters of the New Testament. I mean who love God more than they love me and will tell me the truth even when I don't want to hear it. You look around our culture today, it's particularly Chicago land, and you see examples, it's not hard to find, of pastors leading large churches who have taken nosedives. There's no system of church government that can perfectly prevent that, human sin. I think our system has a lot of checks and balances and protections in it, but nobody's above. And I don't believe those individuals started out as bad guys. What happens? Over time, you're not surrounded. And I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about my own life, but you, it applies to you as well. If you don't have men in proximity to your life who know you and love you, but they love Jesus more, and, will, and they're not afraid of you, will tell you the truth, you're in a vulnerable, dangerous spot. It's not a good place to be. And it's a matter of time. You're a sitting duck. What a friend Paul is to Philemon and Onesimus. To say, you too have an opportunity to do something here that will be the picture of the love of Christ in action. Don't miss this opportunity, he's saying. Because of the gospel, Philemon and Onesimus are equal before God. They're brothers. Let me read to you from Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. This is, by the way, Colossians is the letter Paul wrote to the house church meeting in Philemon's house. Colossians 3, verse 11. won't be on the screen here, but... We'll start with verse 10, excuse me. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. 
put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, compassion and hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. This is written after, by the way, the letter to Philemon. Think about that for a minute. He's writing this to the church that meets in Philemon's house. Saying, in Christ, there's no such thing as slave or free. All, Christ is all, and we are all in all. Now, I don't know where you find yourself in the story at this moment. Obviously, we're all Onesimus. But maybe there's some guy in your life, some person in your life, family member, friend, co-worker, and you share something in Christ with them. You know they're a believer. And you see something in their life that you know perhaps you're the one person Reading this story again reminded me, I've got somebody. I've got somebody who's, that I need to talk to. And I have been, not, none, none of you, well, maybe, no. <laughs> somebody, we have a long-distance relationship now of sorts. I used to be under their authority. Now we're peers of sorts, and I see something that isn't good. And perhaps I'm the one person, I, not the one, but I have a platform. I have, a, I have an opportunity to speak into their life, and I've been not wanting to do it because of our old relationship. I sort of still feel like the younger brother kind of thing, you know? But I know I need to talk to them. And I need to make the appeal on the basis of love, what we share in Christ. Not because I'm smarter than you, not because I'm better than you, not because I see something you don't, but because we both share in Jesus something that's stronger than all this stuff. Maybe you have someone as well. Maybe you, you're somebody here and you need someone to speak to you. Anyway, it's an amazing story. I love this story. We could spend a lot more time unpacking it. I'm going to turn you to your tables and, have, and encourage you to discuss not just these questions that are here. First of all, do you have a friend or friends who's committed to praying for you every day? If so, who are they? Do you have someone who's concerned for your spiritual growth? How often do you talk with that person? And do you have a friend who's willing to call out the best in you? Um, I've shared this before, but years ago I went to Angola Prison in Louisiana um, and visited the remarkable gospel ministry happening in one of the darkest, uh, most dangerous prisons in our country. Um, And Reverend Tony was the chaplain, uh, the head chaplain of 6,000 inmates, 18,000 acres on an oxbow of Mississippi River. It's a massive complex, six different uh, prison compounds inside this this area, but he was the chaplain over all of these uh, prisons and systems. And I was talking to him about, you know, jailhouse conversions. You know, you hear about this, right? Guys who make decisions to trust in Christ or become, get religion so they'll get in good with the guards, maybe they'll be uh, trustees or they'll get more privileges, because particularly if there's a culture of religion in the system. Uh, And I said, how do you know the difference between guys who have genuinely trusted in Jesus, who really are being transformed, and those who are just kind of playing the game to get the perks? And he said, in his good old boy Mississippi voice, he said, we have two things on the inside that you don't have on the outside. We got time and proximity. (laughs) Which you think, that's brilliant. He said, enough time and and enough, being close enough, and you see if somebody's for real. So you think about these questions with men in your life. Are these men that have time and proximity? They have enough access and proximity to what's really going on with you, and you spend enough time with them for them to know and for you to know them. Ready? I'll turn you to your tables and then come back up and wrap us up in a few minutes for prayer.